Correlation doesn't imply causation. We've all heard this phrase and it's for a good reason. A recently published paper stirred up quite the discussion on social media, being used as evidence of training causing not only an increase in muscle size, which is usually called hypertrophy, but also the number of muscle fibers called hyperplasia. But what do we actually mean by causation? How do we identify causal effects? And how does this impact our interpretations of different study designs? In this first installment of the Methods Matter series, we'll go through a basic crash course in causal inference using this new study as an example throughout. The recent study by Mayo and colleagues utilized a simple cross-sectional study design. Various measures of muscle architecture were assessed in 16 trained and 13 untrained participants. The variable with potentially the most interesting findings was the estimated fiber number, calculated by dividing the total muscle size by the average fiber size. The results of the study showed there was not only greater total muscle size in trained individuals, but also a greater estimated fiber number. The existing data on this concept seems to be much less clear. So does training cause hyperplasia? Let's dig into some of the basics of causal inference to address this question. Causality can be defined as the contribution of one event to the production of another event, where the cause is at least partially responsible for the effect, and the effect is at least partially dependent on the cause. In a simpler sense, I like to think about causality as the effect of having done otherwise, or observing what would happen in an identical scenario except for a single change. In the present study, the cause we're attempting to investigate is the effect of resistance training on muscle fiber number. We can symbolize this with the following graph. Now, in a cross-sectional experiment, there could be multiple confounding variables that bias the relationship we're attempting to investigate. One candidate could be the baseline fiber number of participants prior to training. Logic would go something like this. If an individual with higher number of baseline muscle fibers are more likely to seek out resistance training and stick with it, resistance training may purely be a form of selection bias rather than having a true causal effect on fiber number. This could be perceived as talent for the task, similar to heightened basketball in which taller individuals are likely to seek out the sport independent of skill to some degree. Now, how much does this really impact our ability to detect signal from noise? The answer might surprise you, and here's a basic example with some simulated data. In this data set, I've simulated it such that we know there is no true relationship between X, training status, and Y, muscle fiber number. Without considering the influence of the confounding variable, this is what the estimated effect looks like. You can see a strong positive relationship suggesting that training is associated with an increase in myofiber number. Now I've also simulated the confounding variable Z, which we can call baseline myofiber number, which has a very strong positive relationship with the myofiber number observed in the study. After we adjust for the influence of Z, which is baseline myofiber number, the relationship between X and Y disappears entirely, showing a slight negative relationship, which we know is closer to the true effect since I simulated the data. Now the important thing here is that the confounding variables aren't just noise making the patterns we seek to detect weaker, they can entirely deceive us. So coming back to the study at hand, how do we interpret the findings? Without a hypothesized causal model that attempts to delineate all potential confounding variables, I view this study as mostly hypothesis generating for future work um, to investigate further. The findings are interesting, but we can't really conclude why they occurred with any sort of confidence. These situations are where randomized control trials are really helpful. They can help us isolate the causal effects very efficiently. If we go back to our causal graph, randomization allows us to eliminate all other causes of the independent variable, as it's entirely determined by the researchers, and thereby eliminates the bias introduced by the confounding variables. But the benefits of randomization can extend even further. They help to control against unknown confounding variables, which can bias observational studies even when a well thought out causal model is put forward. While there are limitations to cross-sectional studies and other observational research, I do think they get some unnecessary hate. The reality is the situations in which randomized control trials aren't feasible are still worth studying. One example is the impact of smoking on various health-related outcomes, and in that case, randomization would simply be unethical. Moreover, observational data sets often have a ton of benefits that RCTs, particularly in our field, typically lack. Massive sample sizes, ecologically valid conditions, and much longer study durations that actually look at the timelines that were interested in the effects. Properly isolating causal effects is one of the most challenging, but also the most interesting aspects of research. Understanding some basic principles about causality and how data can deceive us in a variety of ways can make us all better consumers of information and allow us to apply research to our training more effectively. While the jury is still out with respect to hyperplasia and training, hopefully this video helped to walk through why the present study isn't particularly strong evidence of a causal effect between the two. 
If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, and let us know if you'd like to see more of the Methods Matter series. If you want more free content like this directly in your inbox, sign up for the newsletter, which is the first link below.